Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. We're delighted that you could join us for this webinar. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. The session is being recorded, and we'll send you the recording at the conclusion of the event. And you can submit questions anytime by typing them into the GoToWebinars questions feature. We will have time for Q&A. So with that out of the way, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar. I'm Rachel Field, Director of Leadership and Diversity Programs here at Women's World Banking, and I'll be moderating today's session. Women's World Banking is a global nonprofit devoted to giving more low-income women access to the financial tools and resources they require to build security and prosperity. For more than 35 years, we have worked with financial institutions to show them the benefit of investing in women as customers and as leaders. Our leadership and diversity programs support institutions in building leadership capacity and creating inclusive workplaces to attract and retain diverse talent so they can be better prepared to serve the low-income women's market segment. So this year, to celebrate our 10-year anniversary of our signature Women in Leadership program, we're hosting a series of webinars to take a deeper look at how we can close the gender gap, particularly in financial services. The theme for today's conversation is gender equality is good for business. We'll highlight the experience of emerging markets and what impact investing can offer to help close the gender gap. So now I'd like to introduce the panelists for our conversation today. Ekwa Awusu Okonar is Associate Director, LeapFrog Investments. LeapFrog is a specialist investor in emerging markets backed by a distinctive profit with a purpose approach. ECOA leads the people, performance, and organization change initiatives for LeapFrog's investments portfolio companies. CJ Juhas is Chief Investment Officer, Women's World Banking Asset Management. Women, Women's World Banking Capital Partners is a private equity limited partnership that makes direct equity investments in women-focused financial institutions an investment strategy that builds on our belief that investors can influence institutions to ensure that women are part of their growth strategy and future profitability. And Alice Mwai is Managing Director, Resolution Insurance Kenya. Resolution Insurance is a leading player in the Kenyan health market, providing health insurance to individuals and employees of SMEs. They partner with a strong network of over 850 experienced doctors, hospitals, and clinics across East Africa, and they're a recent winner of Kenya, Kenya's Medical Insurance Provider of the Year. So to start the conversation, the topic of gender diversity is not really a new one, but it does seem like people are talking about it more. Some position it as the ability to mirror the market. Others look at it through the lens of diversity of thought. And we know research has shown a correlation between having more women in senior leadership roles with better financial performance. Yet, despite the business case, the needle on gender diversity has not moved much. However, many of these studies focus on corporations in the US and Europe. Interestingly, Women's World Banking's network members who are from emerging markets are demonstrating the business case. Those with a higher percentage of women board members, leaders, and managers actually see higher returns and reach more women clients. So today's webinar panelists come from the world of impact investing. They invest in high growth, profit with purpose businesses in emerging markets. And we'll also hear from Resolution Kenya, an institution on the receiving end of this capital. So Ekwa, I'd like to start by asking you, how does the issue of gender diversity play in your work? Is it a concern among your investees? Thanks, Rachel. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think I'll start off by perhaps just giving a little bit more information around LeapFrog Investments. Um, as you've already mentioned, we are an impact investor. And we invest in extraordinary businesses across Africa and Asia. But what I guess sets us apart from other impact investors is the approach that we take, and it's one that we call profit with purpose. What that means is that we focus on achieving both social and financial results 
we see these two as going hand in hand and there's no compromise between the two. How we go about bringing this to life is in two ways. Firstly, we go about setting financial, social and governance KPIs when we first invest in a company and track these continuously throughout the life cycle of that investment. We do that by using a framework that we call FIRM and FIRM consists of financial, impact, innovation and risk management KPIs. On the other side, to make this also happen, we have a team of dedicated professionals um, within LeapFrog that are extremely hands-on with their expertise in supporting the companies to realize their strategic objectives. I think what's important to note is that taking that approach has been beneficial on so many fronts. One for the companies in which we invest in, but also for the communities in which they serve. And what we can see today, if we can show this slide, is that today our companies are showing really strong financial and social returns. And our companies are reaching 91.4 million people through the provision of the essential financial and healthcare services that they're providing. Out of that 91.4 million people, 44.8 are women and girls. So although as LeapFrog we do not specifically have a gender lens to what we do, it is clear from the statistics and from the performance of our portfolio companies that this is a very important part of the story, one which we certainly cannot ignore. And in my role, um, that's already been outlined, um, a very important part of that is focusing on leadership, on board composition and on talent management which are critical pieces to both showing the internal reflection of gender diversity, but also equips the companies to be able to execute on some of those um, strategic objectives uh, more comprehensively. Thank you, Ekwa. Um, I'd like to turn to Alice. Um, Resolution Insurance is an investee of LeapFrog. Can you talk a bit about your company's approach to gender diversity? Okay, so, um, so Kenya is at this point where we are very aware of the need for gender diversity. Having um, constituted our, well, the mandated our constitution in 2010, and now in the process in the last few years of the implementing it as a country. So our constitution demands that we must meet a minimum of 30% presentation of either gender in public uh, appointments. And this has uh, had a bearing on uh, appointments to both of different companies on our stock exchange as well as on large organizations. So we are we are increasingly seeing more women being appointed as CEOs and, and actually in the insurance sector currently this year we've seen three female CEOs being appointed. Um, and so my working life at Resolution Side when I joined in as an accountant was about 13 years ago. It has taken varied experiences across different functions to arrive at this point where I am now the MD of the Kenyan subsidiary, which is the largest subsidiary. Our senior management team is well diversified. We have a gender representation of about 50-50. And whereas we did not set out with a plan to achieve this diversity, looking back we can see where we need to behave that brought us to this result. So various factors came together over, the, over time, the strongest of which was a view of the founder CEO, uh, Peter Rwati, who is now our group CEO. And in addition to this, our new shareholders, as I mentioned, have provided us with KPIs and, and ways in which we monitor, um, among other things, our gender diversity, both on our client look and in our management team and our staffing uh, ratio. Going back, in forming a team, uh, our CEO found uh, viewed members, team members. Has also provided a tiring female leader model that look like red. So this has provided a bit of sure that it is possible to succeed as resolution as a woman. It has also helped us with having managers and board members, both male and female to experience diversified leadership and thereby reinforce the culture of this diversity being a normal situation, a normal current in the, in the running of business. 
So our pipeline of leadership talent is now very well balanced between both genders, and it's a place that we are very happy to find ourselves in. So Alice, thank you for that. I do want to mention that we are having a bit of background noise, um, but just to pick up on some of the points that I heard you say, it sounds like there are some key metrics in place to establish accountability around diversity. And I noticed as well, even on your website, that your very senior leadership, that there's a, you know, a real balance in terms of gender diversity. I'd yes, like to... Oh, go ahead. Yes, it is. And um, as I said, we did not set out to measure or to embed gender diversity. But uh, in, in development, um, especially when we brought in Litrop as a shareholder, we have now started monitoring um, those ratios and ensuring that we are driving the gender diversity agenda across both our client book, our staff ratios, and our management team, as well as our board. Thank you for that. So now I'd like to turn to CJ. Um, CJ Capital Partners is specifically a gender lens investor. So can you talk a bit about how gender diversity plays into your strategy? Sure. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I would say uh, that gender diversity is, in fact, our strategy. Um, Women's World Banking is committed to providing inclusive finance, especially for women. And so our equity fund is seeking to invest in institutions who are either already quite gender diverse or have both a commitment and the capacity to become gender diverse. And so using gender diversity as a differentiator to drive our investments and our investment choices, we actually expect to outperform our peer group. So like, and, and by outperform, I mean financially. So as Aqua said, you know, where Nifron doesn't believe there's um, any kind of trade-off between social and financial goals, we'd even say in the case of gender, it is an indicator for good financial performance. And we actually have good reason to believe that. Um, Rachel, you mentioned there's a lot of studies already out there showing a correlation between gender diversity and, uh, and business performance. And I just wanted to throw up a couple slides from one of my recent favorite studies, um, one of the reasons I like this study is that it comes from Credit Suisse uh, itself, um, which is not you know, known as specifically a gender research house. And it is um, from interviewing uh, over 30, uh, sorry, 3,000 um, companies in 40 countries. And what we see in the first slide is um, just an example of comparing over the years companies that have no women on the board versus companies that have one or at least two women on the board. And you can see there's a 25 to 50 percent increase in return on equity consistently year on year just by putting a woman on the board. Mm. And the next slide um, shows the correlation between um, women CEOs and ROE. And you see a very similar story where um, you have a uh, 4% increase, um, 4 percentage point increase, nearly 3.5, between ROE for male-run uh, enterprises and female-run enterprises. And the last slide, um, if we could move forward, shows uh, CEO plus women in senior leadership, leadership position. And you see, again, a very similar increase in ROE. So what this tells me, this, this one study, um, shows that on the contrary, having a gender diverse organization is not something that's going to cost you, but rather something that will have a very salutary effect on your ROE. And then I'd like to just, while we're dropping names here, uh, <laughs> turn to a Goldman Sachs study. Um, for one more. And um, if you can't quite get your uh, head around what that number is, that's 12 trillion. And that came out of a uh, recent Goldman Sachs research study, which basically said if every country in the world 
just match the rate of improvement on gender diversity to that of it, the best performing country in its region. And in some cases, this is a pretty low bar, right? But if we just did that, we would add 12 trillion to the global, the global economy by 2025. And so what this slide underscores for me, um, and that we are investing behind this theory, women are not a cost center. And women is not just a social issue. Women is absolutely a business performance issue. And um, we are in the fortunate or unfortunate position, depending on how you look at it, to be one of the first investors that is actually investing behind this theory. And so I do think, and we all expect, we'll outperform for that reason. Thank you, CJ. Um, so let's actually move to some examples. So the studies, as you mentioned, are quite compelling. Um, Echo, I'd like to start with you. If you could share some examples of how those higher levels of gender diversity are driving the bottom line financially. Thanks, Rachel. Indeed. Um, with our investee companies, we do see a very strong correlation between gender diversity and financial performance. Um, and if we can just put up the slide um, as, as I talk through that. Um, I think the first thing to say is that across our companies, women represent around 25% of leadership positions, ranging from senior management to CEO to board members. And within that pool, there are some notable women um, that's really worth mentioning. Um, Kashema Fernandez, the CEO of IFMR in India, um, recently won the Times Ascent Women in Leadership Award um, this year. We have Helena Poker um, at Petra, who's a senior executive there as well, Matilda Strom, just to name a few. And of course, we have Alice on the call with us, on the webinar with us today. More importantly, um, or as equally important, we have that good representation of women in leadership across our portfolio companies. But the other part of this as well is, of course, women as customers. Six of our 14 companies have a customer base that is majority women. This ranges from approximately 47 to 70% of women customers for those companies. And these companies are growing at a rate of 29% annual revenue each year, well above emerging market growth rates in the markets in which we operate. And in addition to that, supporting jobs of approximately 102,000 globally. I mean, these are fantastic uh, um, statistics or data points, given that um, unlike Women's World Banking, we're not an exclusively gender-focused um, investor. However, these prove that with some of our companies where gender diversity plays a key role in their strategy, or some of the strategic initiatives which they drive, that the numbers are really beginning to show that correlation between gender diversity and the performance of the companies, as well as the impact it's having in the communities in which they operate. I think it's also important to note, as has already been mentioned, it's around the board composition of these companies. I'm happy to say that you know we have partners that proactively are committed to um, looking for or ensuring that when there is an opening on a board that we do all that we can to, um, to scan the market and ensure that we are speaking to the right people in those markets and making sure that we have the right talent, the right qualifications, the right experience and that we are speaking with um, prominent women in those markets um, to make or to introduce them to some of the, the possibilities on the board. So I think all in all, um, this demonstrates that, as CJ earlier said, this is not just a good to have um, or something that's just good to do, but it's really critical and central to many of our company's um, business case. Um, to make the financial performance and to deliver the financial performance that we see today. Great. Thank you, Ekla. Um, Alice, I'd like to turn to you again as an investee company. Can you speak a bit about 
resolution insurance, um, either around women as clients or how you are seeing the connection between gender diversity and financial performance, specifically at your organization. Right. Um, so looking at our client, let me give a bit more of a story around a cohort number. So looking at our client's book and having conducted uh, research, we are aware that majority of the time, um, the financial investment for our services is made by the man in the family who, is the, um, who provides a bigger proportion of the family income. However, we are also aware, especially in health insurance, that uh, the women consume uh, or interact with the logistics of our service. And so most of the time, uh, it's them that we are dealing with, uh, being the primary caregiver in the family. So our success as a business is, is therefore determined largely by women in that space, and we are keenly aware of this. And as we, when we also look at our agency force, and that's the agency uh, selling agents force, we find that women outperform men uh, by about a ratio of 7 to 3 out of 10. Um, and and they, are consistently, they consistently bring in business every month. So f for us, that's, with the woman in the, in the agency, of course, it's critical. And uh, our strategy is now to expand into our client pool um, of the emerging consumer space. And this is the person who has not been previously insured for one reason or another, and largely usually because we have not structured our products effectively or we have not communicated with them in a manner that addresses their needs. One of the significant channels we find that we will certainly use um, in, in making this project economically viable is what we call women groups in Kenya. So in Kenya, women come together to form women groups and they, they, they jointly push forward their agenda on investments and um, other social activities. And so this is a very good channel to which we can tap into, um, obviously with a win-win uh, partnership with them, and, and it will give us significant growth uh, percentages in, in, the, in the space of the emerging consumer. So in addition to, to this, we also find that uh, in, the, in terms of uh, where we have installment payments, the default rate for women is much lower than that of men. And so from a business perspective, this makes absolute sense in, in saying that this uh, brings financial, superior financial return in certain areas. One of the other things we've noticed is that in motor insurance, the loss ratios we find, um, we find that women's loss ratios are lower than male loss ratios, meaning you're making a better margin of the woman, and therefore, subsequently, sometimes you see that the woman is given a lower price in terms of motor insurance than the man. So certainly, there is a case for, for it's not a good to have as a core thing. It's an absolute necessity in business to, to, to think uh, and, and to focus um, our attention on, on both genders, obviously, uh, to ensure that we can get the best out of it. And actually, um, at Women's World Banking, we have also found similar results in terms of repayment rates and uh, loan defaults in terms of women as clients. And it sounds like a lot of the work that you're doing is really looking at not just women in leadership roles, but as well the sales force and how to make those connections on the ground. Um, so thank you for that. I'd like to turn to CJ and ask you, can you give us uh, some examples from Capital Partners as well? Thanks, Rachel. Um, absolutely. And I think I'm, I'm just going to play off of uh, what, what Alice was just saying in terms of um, women borrowers consistently being shown to have a lower uh, default rate or they are better credit quality, better credit risk. So we put up a slide. Um, that it comes from research we did back in uh, 2010, in fact, um, but we see this consistently. We looked at tw 2,000 microfinance institutions. We, we invest in microfinance exclusively or in inclusive finance. And when you look at the landscape, um, you see that as an institution increases its percentage of female borrowers, you see on the yellow line um, at the bottom, the default rate can 
consistently goes down. And for a financial institution, that is obviously a very critical business input, is to get that default rate down. Um, the purple line is even more uh, impressive. You see how the return on assets overall really increases dramatically the more women uh, you have in your borrower base. So again, this is a very compelling story for us to actually invest behind this strategy. Um, and some of our institutions that we invest in, they sort of get this implicitly. Um, there is an example from an institution that attended one of the leadership trainings that Women's World Banking hosted and really began to invest heavily into a women's strategy. Um, not surprisingly, that also resulted in an investment by um, Women's World Banking Capital Partners. But um, some of the interesting things they've done is they're actually incentivizing their loan officers by giving them more bonus points for finding women clients over um, male clients. So they're really investing behind this, you know, having more women in our portfolio will increase our, our performance. And they've also um, created, as, as Alice was mentioning, it's really important to get the right product so that it appeals mm -hmm. to women. And so they're investing in this as well. And one of the things they're also trying to look at is if they can actually capitalize on the fact that women are better credit risks or have a lower default rate, could you actually credit price? Meaning offer them a lower interest rate because they're costing you less on your um, LP NPLs in your portfolio. So that's a great story of how one of our um, investing companies is really investing behind this. If I flip to the next slide, I just um, want to show a very simple picture. This is, this is sort of baseline of what we look at in our investing companies. This is an, another investing company where you can see the percentage of women in their gross loan portfolio overall and their percentage of women in the non-performing loan portfolio overall, which is much less. And in fact, it translates into every woman is 50% less likely in this uh, institution, example, 50% less likely to default on a loan than every man. But the interesting thing is that this number has actually gone down. There, despite this, their percentage of women overall went down from 2014 to 2015. So this is something um, that you know we really try to start getting a little bit activist with management when we can show them their own data and ask pointed questions about how they are capitalizing on this information. So CJ, I'd like to just dig a little bit deeper into that because you know, as we've said thus far this morning, the business case is clear. We've seen particular examples where there's a connection to better performance. And so even when your even when investee companies see their own data, what is happening that they're not then moving forward or taking steps to ensure more gender parity in their organization? Well, that's something that we're really trying to tease out, Rachel, because in the face of evidence that women are good for business, we sometimes still run into this idea that serving women is a social issue or um, even a cost center. And you hear comments like, um, look, we're a bank now. We don't have time to focus on these social issues or we have to work on the bottom line without a real recognition that women are actually helping that bottom line. Um, and so we're, we're up against entrenched views. And interestingly, we see those more coming from men than women, which is, and I think Alice alluded this, to this as well, the more women you have in leadership positions, the, the less you have this entrenched view that serving women is, is going to cost you. Um, but then there's also a lot of cultural um, issues that come into play which um, I think, you know, and, and some, you know, we, we can't just throw up our hands when we run into cultural issues and say, well, there's nothing to be done about that, because there really are things to be done about that. But I might be getting ahead of myself a little here. <laughs> and for Alice 
and Ekwa, can you also speak to what are some of the things that you're seeing around the resistance to this? I think, I think sometimes it... We'll start with you, Ekwa. <laughs> no problem. Um, I think it's it is a lot to do with what CJ has already outlined. I think there is a lack of understanding with regards to consumers. And a lot of this perhaps can be partially resolved by understanding the markets in which one operates. If you understand your consumers in more details and the markets that you operate in and the benefits that can come from having a more inclusive customer base and how that can impact the bottom line, then I think for many people that makes business sense. When the conversation tends to hinge on just, you know, gender diversity is good to do and we should just serve more women, a lot of the time that sort of conversation just doesn't go too far. So it's, it's the element of the business case. You know, what is the business case for this? You know, and the business case is the more inclusive you are with regards to the products and services and the distribution channels that you have, the more profit you're going to make. It's as simple as that. And, you know, more needs to be done to demonstrate, I guess, that manner of putting forward um, the debate or, or the conversation around this. Um, and that's talking about it from a very, I guess, very sensible position. But there are just some, you know, you may come across individuals or leaders that simply just don't see the value of going down this route. And that's been known to happen, not necessarily with the leapfrog, but you know, in terms of my wider experience around diversity and inclusion, you know, there's such competing focuses for businesses that to position that debate to move and focus on something else sometimes is a very, very um, difficult um, strategy to put on the table. Thank you, Aqua and Alice. Your thoughts on the on what's getting in the way, knowing seeing the business case, knowing it's there. What's getting in the way, or what have you done at um, in your company to move this forward? So, um, as I said, I think there's a there's a language issue. So, when we, my opinion, not just my personal opinion, when we harp on the women agenda. Uh, it sort of feel, seems to be excluding the male. So how do we how do we how do we work on our language so that it is an inclusive affair? So when you're talking about the financial return that that one could get from the female gender, then you're talking about a target market, not necessarily the woman. It is a target market and a significant one that one should be addressing from an economic lens, not a social lens. So I think it's just gaining and, and, and getting to communicate and to gain an understanding around um, the issue that this is not a women's agenda, this is a business agenda across yeah. the entire map, you know, from clients to your management team, to your staff ratios, to your suppliers, to your agency for selling, selling distribution for, really. So once again, it really does come back to the market opportunity. And men have a role to play as well. This is about the market and the business opportunity. Yes. So, so I'm going to turn back to um, CJ and ask, what are some of the tools that you as an investor have at your disposal to really push the needle on gender diversity? For us, um, and again echoing something that um, Aqua said, really data collection is where it starts. And when we collect data, we're actually trying to collect a little more sophisticated data and a little deeper look than just how many women among your client base, how many women on staff. For example, um, at a minimum, we also ask our investees, we ask them to gender disaggregate their whole portfolio so that we can see um, not, you know, how many women are getting group loans versus how many women are getting individual loans or how many women are getting um, 
education loans versus small business loans, things like that, because that will tell you a lot. Um, we're also looking at percentage of new women borrowers. So if we know your women borrowers are good, from year to year, are you actually increasing the number of new women you're bringing on board, um, or are you losing them, as in the case of, of the recent example I showed? Um, related to that, what is the retention rate of your client base? And we um, also almost inevitably find that women are stickier, meaning you're less likely to lose them. And that's a very important um, attribute uh, positive to your bottom line. It's a lot less costly to keep a customer than to acquire one. Um, we look at average loan sizes. Are you making smaller loans to your women, i.e. better customers? Because that happens a lot as well. We're obviously looking at portfolio at risk, gender disaggregated. So where does your, how, how do women stack up to men in terms of credit quality? And then similarly, we're looking at um, gender disaggregating your staff, but also what are your women's staff retention rates. So we're trying to really go granular. And when we have this type of information, the beauty of it, once you have the data, is that you can start a really substantive conversation. And you can start that conversation in the boardroom as an investor. And you can start it with management. And you can show those numbers and simply ask, why is this happening, and what are we going to do about it? And, and at that point, that question has to be addressed. You can't simply say, we don't have time for this, et cetera. Um, and then as Women's World Banking, I mean, we also have a little bit of a microphone out to the industry, so we can talk about this at conferences and try to increase awareness overall. And then importantly for our investing institutions, we can also deliver technical assistance. So not only can we ask the questions, but we can help craft the solutions and the strategies going forward. And um, when we can bring that all together, I think that's when we're really having a very positive impact on our portfolio company. It really paints a very compelling picture that is completely fact-based. And, and they're individual facts. Like, this isn't a Credit Suisse research report. This is your own database. So. And, um, I mean, we've gotten a, a number of questions that have come in. I just want to ask ECWA before we open it up. What kind of support do, does LeapFrog provide that also will move this agenda forward? Yeah, so, so Rachel, um, this is really a multifaceted approach um, that can be provided um, in terms of moving that needle. And I think the first one stems from our um, distinct approach around profit with purpose. Um, as I previously said, you know, the companies that we invest in, we, we work long and hard to ensure that we have a values alignment from the outset. I think the other one is around the markets in which our companies operate, which is 22 of these, um, a large number of our customers are emerging consumers. Um, so again, these are people that typically have never had access to financial services products or healthcare services. I think the other angle of looking at this as well is around um, the business model of the companies in which we invest in as well. I mentioned IFMR earlier on, and IFMR's um, business model is focused on women, and this comes from providing women with tools to improve the economic well-being of the household. So for some of our companies, this is a huge focus for them, this is what they deliver in their markets, and women are predominantly um, the distribution channel that you use um, to enable them to get into some of the rural communities in which they operate. But I think more importantly as well, it's around what we do as a company on a daily basis. We have a very strong partnership with our portfolio companies, and that partnership comes from the partners to the deal leads and to the experts that reside within LeapFrog. And with those experts comes a multitude of knowledge and skills that we support our portfolio companies with. So we talk about impact. You know, we talk about the strategy being set, then we talk about, okay, so how do we look at the sales organization, for example, and distribution? Is there enough skills within the organizations to make this happen? If not, we have experts that can support with that, along with core operations, the measurement we've already talked about, technology and data, etc. 
So from LeapFrog's perspective, this is very much a multifaceted approach. It works from you know, how we choose the investment in the first instance to um, supporting with strategic and operational imperatives for that organization to the people and organizational effectiveness support that's given around board composition, leadership, talent acquisition, management, etc. And now I know that's a lot, but really for impact to happen, it has to be that much effort that's put into it. It's, it's a holistic approach, both from the business case as well as the technical assistance and support. Very um, much so. I'm going to open it up to questions. One particularly came in around if there's an institution that is just getting started in terms of looking at gender diversity, where would be a good place to start? And Ekwa, that, that question was directed for you. Yeah, and I, I think CJ also picked up on this point earlier on. And I think one has to begin with understanding your market. Understanding your market, understanding your business, understanding um, the culture in which you operate as well is, is very important. And from that perspective, it's been able to develop, um, again, the business case that we talked about that becomes part of the business agenda. So this is not you know, a nice to do. This is because it's going to make sense to do. And I think with all things, it's ensuring that you have leadership buy-in from the outset in terms of the approach that one wants to take. Um, leadership support for any strategy, whether it's gender diversity or otherwise, is absolutely important. And we need to know that we have that leadership support for that. And I think from that, um, one can then begin to outline what is imperative for that business. Um, whether it's developing policies, whether it's getting the talent in, because representation is also a very part of a, a big part of the story to represent women within the organisation to be able to um, deliver some of some of this on the agenda. Um, I, I would echo everything that um, that uh, Aqua said. Um, if you're a lone wolf in your organization who are the first person who believes that really you should start looking at this stuff, again, I would start with data collection. And that, even the attempt to collect the data will let you know if you have leadership buy-in or not. Because in some organizations, they, you know, there will be even a lack of interest to gender disaggregate data or a lack of will. Um, but if you are able to get the data as a starting point, you'll know what your own internal story is. And you can start looking at what the, you know, what would be the first steps for improvement. Is it staff? Is it clients? Et cetera. And then, uh, and then you can start making decisions and, and also start convincing management. Yeah, I know for me, I've seen in a number of different companies gender diversity initiatives advance unfortunately without that piece of data behind it, kind of as a, this is the right thing to do, right. and that doesn't really have the kind of legs that will move that needle. Right. It sort of never goes anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, another question came in, this is for all of you, so Alice, let's start with you. The question is, does it make a difference in terms of the type of business training given to male versus female clients? Do women need more skill building than men? So, and this is just my my experience, or my belief that uh, they do not need women do not need a higher level of skill training, but we do need a higher preparation to be able to operate in a male-dominated um, environment and still hold our own. That would be my view. And so there's a necessity for providing um, mentorship and coaching um, opportunities for the women that we want to, to, to grow into leaders to be able to handle um, what's going to be coming at them, especially when um, you're the first one um, coming into an organization that, that has not been um, diversified before. So to speak. So it's, it's not a question of women needing more training, but it is a recognition 
of some of the obstacles, especially if you're one of the first women in an organization that you're operating in. You're absolutely right. Another question came in speaking of being the only woman, um, and this is directed towards CJ. Are you usually the only woman on the board? And what's that like? And what if there were more women? Well, that's interesting. I might not be the best person to ask this because, because of our um, view on the investments that we make, we're likely to look for uh, an institution that already has women on the board. So I'm unlikely to be the only one. Um, but what I have seen happen is that as the institution grows and you bring in more and more professional investors who are taking over board seats, they seem to have no women to appoint to those boards. So you get diluted. Um, and I recently left a board. Uh, it was a great success story. The institution grew, went through several more capital rounds. But as I left, that it had gone from, I think, 30% women on the board to one woman on the board. And, and one of my closing remarks amid lots of congratulations was, you know, just to point out and to lament the fact uh, that there were no, you know, we were losing women on the board uh, to remind everyone that um, this is an important, gender diversity is important for the business and that they should certainly make an effort to recruit more women. So just to, left with a call to action. There have been other studies that say a woman on the board is not really effective as a diversity um, character until there's at least two others. That it actually takes three women before the women don't feel isolated and somewhat, I don't know if intimidated is the right word, but let's say deluded. But once you have three, it, it's almost like a normal uh, state of affairs. And then that benefit of having women on the boards really starts to play. Picking up on women on boards, um, there, you know, a number of countries have quotas in place in terms of board membership, similarly in governments in terms of women parliamentarians. So for each of you, curious to know your thoughts around are quotas the way to go? Echo, why don't we start with you on that question? So I, I know there's a lot of debate around this particular question, Rachel. It, it's an interesting one. And, and it comes from you know, women not wanting to feel that you know, we've just been put in that position because we're a woman. You know, mm -hmm. A lot of women have gone through years of education, training, experience, etc. And everyone wants to feel that they've got into a position because of their experience and credibility and worthiness. So that is one of the arguments against perhaps not having quotas um, because you don't want um, that appointment to be um, misconstrued in any way. However, if one looks on the other side of the argument where we said as we began this webinar that we have been on this journey for a very long time and there has been progress on many fronts and yet when we still look at the data and yet when we still look at society and yet when we still look at companies and businesses and investments etc we're still not progressing as well or as far as we thought we would have done by now so then that brings in a stronger case for quotas and says Let's, let's reserve a certain number um, of seats or positions or whatever it might be for women so that we can begin to accelerate the results that we want to see. So I think very much before we think about quotas, you have to understand the culture in which you're in, the business that you're in. Is this going to be accepted? Is it going to make the woman accepted in her position? Or will she be sort of, you know, rejected or, you know, not undermined as such, but it's the word that comes to mind right now for being put in that position just because she's a woman. And I think ultimately, you know, we want to move away from a story that says someone is in that position just because they're a woman. I mean, I, I have a view similar. The fact of the matter is quotas work, and sometimes they're the only things that work because, you know what, men don't know women. So when a, when a board full of men is looking for another board member, guess who they're going to know? 
And uh, and once you have the women there, the women know the women. And uh, <laughs> and also, I mean, you know, they won't take that extra step. They're like, well, we would have liked to have a women, woman, but none applied. But if they're yeah. forced to, guess what? They're going to find them. And, uh, you know, I think quotas is something that can eventually go away, but sometimes the only thing that does work, and let's not call it quotas, let's call it regulation. Mm. I like <laughs> that word. <laughs> Sounds better. <laughs> let's regulate. <laughs> um, we only have a few minutes left, and a, a question came in for Alice that I'd like to ask. And the question mm -hmm. is about acquiring women clients. What if they're afraid of your product, like microfinance, as is the case in rural Nigeria? So how do you mitigate against that fear or that unfamiliarity with a product? Okay, so let me speak from my experience in Kenya. And perhaps uh, there's some borrowing. There's some borrowing that Nigeria can take a thing that circumstances are not the same in Nigeria. So mm -hmm. in Kenya we have um, women groups as I mentioned earlier, and so you come together as a group of women. And and when you're a group, you you have a better acceptance of of risk and a view of risk. So you're not as afraid as if you are alone. So. Perhaps that's one of the ways to demystify um, the product. The other one is that it needs to be simple and speak to the woman as much as possible, where possible. You can actually go into the local language, assuming that uh, the, the the business languages in use are not prevalent in the local setup. So simplicity is key in achieving understanding with the market. You also must find. The, the agency force or the person that you send in to sell for you must understand that market and must most for, for you to achieve success needs to come from that that locality. So then they identify this person as one of our own, speaks our language, understands our challenges, and this person is able to understand the nuances that exist within the cultural setup of where the woman lives. So there's a lot of knowing the woman, knowing the circumstances within which they, they live and operate. And, and listening to them to understand what their fear is, but also developing a product that speaks to their needs um, absolutely and, and brings value to them. So like any other client, it's about really understanding the needs of the client, the concerns, really understanding the local context and the local market, and then mm -hmm. designing products that speak to that. Yes. We have just two minutes left, ladies. I'd like to wrap up and just ask each of you if you have some final words that you'd like to offer around closing the gender gap in financial services. So, Ekwa, let's start with you. Yeah, um, so I think my final words would have to be that um, the concerted effort of, of many businesses, um, LeapFrog, Women's World Banking and others, to um, provide services and to look at this from a gender lens is, is definitely the way forward. And I think the more we continue on this journey, the more we understand the needs and the more we understand how we can deliver and increase the services to women, um, it's, it's, it, I, I can't even find the words right now, but it changes the lives of people ultimately and I think that's what this is all about when we talk about impact it is not just a business it is not just about um, getting more women onto boards or into leadership it is about ultimately changing the lives of women changing the lives of communities and increasing the access of financial services to those that are typically excluded thank you Equa. And Alice, a few uh, final thoughts. Um, for me, gender diversity is, is, is a business agenda. It is not a social agenda. It is a business agenda. We must treat it as such across our different interactions at board levels, at management levels, when you go into the market. There is value to be had by diversifying our lens with which we look at you know, the business environment. However, having said that, um, 
we women have to, um, I think when you're given the opportunity, we must utilize it. As we, we spoke earlier about quotas and, and certain ones of us not applying. So we, we must we must overcome the, the quota the quota thing very quickly so that we then are saying we are coming to the to the board with the from a from a level playing field, not where we've been given quotas. That that can only increase our respect the respect for the women agenda as a business agenda. Thank you. And CJ, final words? I find it hard to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> like what was said. Um, I just like to say it, it's hard work, and what occupies me at the moment is when we really run into super intransigent, transigent questions that make you want to throw up your hands, like I alluded to before, sometimes people just say, it's the culture, and how can you change the culture? And where I ran into this most recently is in India, in rural parts of India, you're trying to get more loan officers, women loan officers, and people are like, it's not the culture. Fathers don't want their daughters working. But if you don't accept that at face value or you dig a little deeper, what we found is fathers worried about their daughter's safety. And if you then didn't go around trying to hire one woman at a time, but you rather hired groups of women into branches, and you hired cohorts, that immediately started to solve the problem. So I just want to, to use that anecdote to say that this is hard work and you run into stumbling blocks everywhere, but we just cannot stop um, and, and we can't stop finding a ways around every single stumbling block no matter how difficult it seems. And then I will just bring back uh, the beautiful sentiment that Aqua said, why are we doing this? because it will change the lives of those women that then get hired, those daughters who find a way to support themselves. And yes, that's what it ultimately is about. Thank you for that. So, I mean, the themes that have emerged from this conversation um, that I'll take away are, one is around intentionality and really start grounding all of your work in the data and the business case. That Two, it's about really digging deeper. So when those when resistance comes along, asking those important questions and really understanding the cultural context. Um, and at the end of the day, it is about improving women's lives. It's about the client. So with that, I want to thank Equus, CJ, and Alice for joining us and sharing your thoughts and your experiences. Thank you to all who joined us today. We hope it was an engaging conversation. We will share the URLs of each institution so you can find out more information about them. And you'll also receive an email with the recording of this webinar. There'll be follow-ups on our blog, so check our website and social media. We urge you to continue to support our initiative, Bank on Her Leadership, by sharing it on social. We'd also love to hear what you thought of the webinar. And so there's a quick survey in the chat window that we'd ask you to complete. The survey will also be included in the email with the recording. And finally, I'd like to ask you to join us in December for another webinar where we will feature graduates of our Global Leadership Program, the Leadership and Diversity for Innovation Program and applications for that program for the 2017 class are open later this week. So check out our leadership page on Women's World Banking for more information about that global leadership program. So thank you again to Aqua, Alice, and CJ. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.